Welcome, everyone. I'm Marty Goldman. Um, welcome on this pre-Thanksgiving panel discussion that we're having. We're privileged to have a really uh, phenomenal panel um, that I'll introduce in just a few minutes. Just to let you know coming attractions, in December, Dr. Hartzell Schaff from Mayo Clinic will be here. In January, Dr. Zogby from Methodist in Texas will be here. February, Dr. Mark Kalinske from University of Pennsylvania. In March, uh, Dr. Califf from Duke and Google uh, will be here. April, Dr. Nishimura. In May, Dr. Braunwald for a special one-on-one -on -one fireside chat with Dr. Fuster. And in June, uh, Marty Leon from Uptown at Columbia. Today's panel discussion is one of the most phenomenal panels that I think I've ever been, hopefully, hopefully um, we'll have many others like this, but really the most phenomenal panel. If you think of the distinguished people we have on the panel, it matches, I think, uh, any panel that you may have seen at the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology. Um, Dr. Bono is a visiting professor, and Dr. Fuster will introduce him more formally. On the panel is Dr. Valentin Fuster, probably the, one of the world's most eminent cardiologists, uh, impacts us all through Jack and Hurst. Dr. Adams, probably the leading mitral valve surgeon in the country, if not one in the world, who's recently been uh, named president of the American Association of Thoracic Surgery, besides being cardiac surgeon in chief here at Mount Sinai. Dr. Kinney, who is probably the, the leading uh, female interventionalist in the country. Uh, Dr. Larakis, who's director of imaging, one of the leaders in structural and valve intervention imaging. And Dr. Pinney, um, professor of medicine and cardiology and director of heart failure across the system. Um, and we're really privileged to have Dr. Greg Stone, who Dr. Fuster was recently able to recruit, who's Director of Academic Affairs for Mount Sinai Health System, Professor of Medicine and Population Health Science and Policy, who spoke to the fellows this morning about all the many different areas where he's going to uh, help mentor them and uh, continue really the path of excellence and outstanding direction cardiology has been taken in. Uh, in the past few years. Um, without really uh, further ado, um, I want to introduce Wakas Malak, who's put together a phenomenal monograph. This is a very difficult, very controversial uh, subject. And if you take the opportunity to, to read it, please, it's still in its uh, unfinished form before being officially published, uh, hopefully in, a, in the near future. Uh, but really give them your attention for the next few minutes. Thank you, Dr. Goldman, for the kind introduction to Dr. Stone for moderating our discussion today and to our esteemed faculty panel, uh, who I will hope provide a very enlightening discussion. Dr. Bono, I would like to thank you again for visiting Mount Sinai today. Uh, we are very lucky to have you here today with us. Um, and we look forward to your teaching and invaluable insight into our controversial topic for today. My name is Wakas Malik. I'm one of the first year cardiology fellows here at the academic track at Mount Sinai. Um, it's a great honor for me to join the distinguished members of the panel today, and I'm privileged to introduce our controversial topic for today. Chronic mitral regurgitation is due to numerous etiologies, but more broadly can be classified into primary mitral regurgitation, which is more commonly known as degenerative MR, or secondary, also known as functional MR. Primary MR arises from structural changes in the valve itself or supporting structures, where a secondary, secondary MR is due to underlying left ventricular dysfunction, either globally or regionally, and uh, due to either ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. Um, the indications for intervention in primary MR are well defined, with surgery being the definitive form of therapy, and more recently, transcatheter interventions for selected patients. However, in contrast, the management of patients with secondary mitral regurgitation is more controversial. Mitral regurgitation is one of the most common valvular disorders and has an estimated prevalence of 1.7% in the United States and increases to 9.3% in those age 75 years or older, with secondary MR being more common than primary MR. 
And furthermore, the prevalence of secondary MR is, is expected to grow as the improvement in survival post MI increases and the prevalence of heart failure continues to grow around the US and around the world. Classically, the management of secondary mitral regurgitation has revolved around the management of the underlying left ventricular pathology. Guideline-directed medical therapy, which includes ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and beta blockers, and more recently, angiotensin receptor neprilysin inhibitors have shown significant benefits in clinical outcomes in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. However, their effect on secondary MR has been more variable. Cardiac resynchronization therapy has also demonstrated significant improvements in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, specifically with left bundle branch block and widened QRS, and also has shown improvements in secondary MR, mortality, left ventricular reverse remodeling, and New York Heart Association functional class. However, despite guideline-directed medical therapy and cardiac resynchronization therapy, there are patients with heart failure who continue to have New York Heart Association class two to four symptoms with moderate to severe functional mitral regurgitation. Many studies have looked at surgical intervention for these patients in the past, but these st studies have failed to show conclusive evidence of benefit on clinical outcomes and prognosis. Therefore, surgery is rarely performed in isolation for secondary mitral regurgitation. In the 1990s, Ottavio Alfieri invented his famous self-named stitch for the purpose of mitral valve repair. Uh, the mitral clip device and emulation of this stitch provides a less invasive option for correcting MR. The Everest II trial first demonstrated the efficacy of the mitral clip device in primary and secondary MR, and subsequent registry data led to both approval for the mitral clip device in patients with primary MR at prohibitive risk for surgery and equipoise for the use of mitral clip in secondary mitral regurgitation. Recently, two landmark trials, MITRA-FR and COAPT, showed diametrically opposed results in these patients, with, uh, in patients with heart failure who underwent implantation. MITRA-FR failed to show a significant clinical benefit uh, with mitral clip impan implantation, whereas COAPT showed a significant reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, mortality, and then also showed a significant improvement in quality of life, functional capacity, and left ventricular reverse remodeling. How do we reconcile these results going forward? Today, we plan to review the pathophysiology and non-invasive evaluation of mitral regurgitation so that we may better understand the therapeutic options for the treatment of mitral regurgitation for both primary and secondary MR. We hope to discuss the current evidence for surgical and transcatheter interventions, their evolving indications, and the potential future directions for further research in rectifying MR. Thank you. Good job, focus. Interesting subject, complex, and uh, a great summary. Well, it's a pleasure today to, for me to introduce a, what I consider is a most unique individual. Most unique because I say professionally and also as a human being. Uh, and this is Dr. Robert Bono. Uh, he was actually born not too far from here, from Camden, New Jersey. And he uh, had his medical degree at the University of Pennsylvania. And then he had his internship and, and residency at UPenn. And then he moved to, uh, as a clinical associate cardiology, cardiologist at the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. And then eventually, uh, he became the, in the institute a senior investigator, um, senior investigator, chief of nuclear cardiology at the section of cardiology branch, and deputy chief of cardiology at, uh, at the branch of NHLBI. He moved to Chicago, Northwestern, in uh, 1992, and where he has been there since. Now, his positions have been Goldberg, Distinguished Professor of Cardiology, Chief of the Division of Cardiology, Department of Medicine, Vice Chairman of the Department of Medicine, and Director of the Center for Cardiovascular Innovation. Okay, I, I can say so many things about this fantastic, wonderful person, but uh, the awards, I don't know, there are so many awards here that uh, I would just say that uh, at NIH, the Director's Award, the American Heart Association, the Gold Award, Distinguished Achievement Award, American College of Cardiology, Distinguished Scientist Award, and on and on and on. 
Uh, he's in the editorial board of all the suspicious journals in the field of cardiovascular disease, uh, in the American Journal of Cardiology, in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology as a section editor, circulation guest editor, European Heart Journal, General of Thoracic and Cardiovascular Surgery, and Cardiovascular Surgery, exactly. And then finally, he took the leadership as an editor in chief of a, maybe about two years ago, maybe about uh, JAMA Cardiology. He's doing a great job in that journal. Uh, from the professional and scientific societies, what I can say, um, he has been in the committee of the boards, uh, board examination, American College of Cardiology. Chairman of the Extramural Continuing Education Committee, Board of Trustees. In the ACC AHA guidelines, you know, in vascular, in the valvula heart disease and others, uh, he has been involved at NIH and in, in all the organizations. And actually, it's interesting, he has been the president of 15 organizations within the college, the American Heart, where he was president. Uh, the uh, NIH and so forth. I think that um, one of the most interesting aspects is that although he appears in a literature with 600 publications, he appears to be very diverse. There is one route where he really evolved, which is from, the, from imaging. And that is he has uh, published about imaging on every aspect in our field, uh, coronary disease, structural heart disease, uh, myocardium, and so forth. So he's very well known in all the aspects of cardiovascular disease, but certainly where he evolved, actually he was from, he evolved originally from radionuclear and subsequently from CT, MRI, and so forth. So thank you for coming today, uh, Robert. It's a pleasure to have you here, uh, and certainly for everybody, the fellows. And let me give you this, uh, this plaque, Robert, which is the outstanding teaching wisdom and expertise as the Anandi Sharma visiting professor, Simon Dyke Memorial Lecture, November 25, 2008. You received this three times. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's different. It's different? What, what's different is we now have uh, Dr. Sharma's father as the uh, Anandi Sharma. So uh, let, let me at least. Uh, Acknowledge uh, Dr. Sharma and his family for the visionary uh, uh, professorship that you've created. So uh, that's what's new. I, I don't think it was the Sharma professorship. No. Okay, good. So he's going to make a picture. Dr. Sharma, come to the picture. Right. Sure. Okay. So I give you this, and uh, the check is not very substantial. No. <laughs> <laughs> that's not what accept that's the, that's accept that's the quality, not the quantity. Yeah, exactly. not the quantity. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so let me see how we are going to do this. Uh, well, you already know the people who are going to participate. Uh, Dr. Adams, uh, Anukini, uh, Lerakis, uh, Simpeni, uh, Sean Penny, then we have here walkers, of course. So all of you, why we don't uh, sit here, and maybe you, you should be in the middle. And you, Dr. Stone, are going to direct the whole operation here. Make the question simple. <laughs> All right, well, fantastic. And uh, Bob, it's great that you could come and spend this uh, day, for, day with us. It means a lot to all of us. And uh, you know, I was thinking among all the awards that you've received, you also most recently received the Transcatheter Cardiovascular Therapeutics Lifetime Achievement Award. So it's very special uh, to me in particular that you're here today. So when we talk about mitral regurgitation therapies, um, as you know, we've evolved, thinking of interventional strategies, um, surgical strategies. We know that to make the right decision for the patient, we need a heart team. And we actually have the heart team sitting here. 
And we actually chose this panel because it almost takes all these expertise and these minds to make the right decision because this is such a complex issue. So we have, we have our um, cardiologists who are valve specialists, such as Dr. Bono. We have our imaging specialists like Larrakis. We have our heart failure specialists, Dr. Penny. We have our interventional cardiologist, um, Dr. Kinney. And we have our mitral surgeon, Dr. Adams. And then, of course, we have Dr. Fuster. Um, who can provide input into all of these areas. So you heard that we think of mitral regurgitation, we break it down as kind of primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation, where there's a problem with the valve or its supporting structures, the mitral valve complex, and secondary or functional MR, where the valve is actually relatively normal until late in the disease, and the problem is more either left ventricular dilatation, either regional or global, or sometimes atrial pathology leading to annular dilatation. So let's start with primary mitral regurgitation. So primary mitral regurgitation is really remains the province of the surgeon. When you've got a patient with severe symptomatic degenerative mitral regurgitation, although we don't have any randomized trials, it's believed that a good mitral repair gets the patient back to their age and sex matched life expectancy. The recurrence rate is very low uh, and the outcomes are excellent. So David, let me start with you. The problem here is that we don't have a lot of great mitral surgeons who are high volume mitral surgeons that, that can perform you know, 30, 50, 100 repairs a year. Um, the guidelines, and Bob can speak about this, you know, say if you are at a center where you have a high likelihood, I think it's 95% or whatever, of a successful mitral valve repair, then this is a class one indication. So, so David, what do, how many great mitral surgeons are there in the country? We don't want patients to go and get mitral valve replacements. What, what can we do about this? The, you know, this has been a, 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 a long-term struggle, Greg, for, for Bob and myself and others that live in this valve world, and that is, is that casual mitral surgery is the norm. In New York State, we published a paper in JAK a few years ago in a mandatory state registry, the average patient undergoes mitral surgery by someone that does eight procedures per year. Eight. Eight per year. And the and this is a, a, a matter of, of education of specialists and, and guidelines and, and the public because it's not necessary. And in fact, part of it is the transparency around it because I, I don't know what these informed consent looks like, but I mean, would you have your hip operated on by someone that did a hip every eight weeks or nine weeks? I, I really doubt it. And it's actually a complex operation. It's not a, that it's a complex operation. It's an operation that has a fair amount of nuance. So it's not something that you can do casually. It's hard to, to you know, to do that. So that's the challenge is trying to concentrate volume um, and, and trying to identify, you know, centers, not just the Clevelands and Mount Sinai's and places like that, but the regional local centers and trying, even within our own health system, trying to get all the mitral surgery done in one expert center. And that's the challenge. And I'm not sure how to solve it, but that's certainly what we're up against. Maybe a great article by Dr. Fuster and Jack would help. <laughs> So, so, so of, of all surgically eligible patients with primary MR, what percent should be able to undergo a repair in, in skilled hands? I mean, for degenerative arm, M, MR, and we, again, we have to know what the degenerative process means, but for prolapse, if your con primary condition is cortical elongation or cortical rupture, your repair rate in, in top centers is 100%. Um, in a center like this, it's been 15 years since a valve like that got replaced, including in the reoperative setting. We do reoperations here for failed repairs from all over the country, four days, three or four days a week. If you have mitral annular calcification, that number is going to go down unless you really do this all the time. And if you have certain less common things like acute aortic mitral angles or minimal tissue on one side or opposing dysfunction, those numbers will go down a little bit, but there are many, we published the first paper in 2012 talking about 100% repair. That was in 740 consecutive patients with one replacement, and that replacement was done for a pre presumed AV disruption that wasn't there. 
all the other patents were repaired. Since that time, there have been four or five major papers talking about 95, 98, 99% repair rate. So it's an established fact that you can build centers that can do very high repair rates. The issue is concentrating volume. So, so Bob and Valentin, help me on the timing for repair. There's a trend to do earlier and earlier repair before you know, we have any permanent loss of uh, LV function, chronic pulmonary hypertension, et cetera. Um, so how early is too early? Um, what should be the uh, indicators today to operate on severe MR? And it's still all severe MR, correct? We don't have any indications yet for moderate MR um, for surgical operation. But for severe MR, how early should we operate? Well, I think if it's severe, we should operate early, and we should send the patient to a surgical center that will um, almost guarantee a uh, not only successful repair, but a durable repair. Um, I'll, I'll leave it up to um, uh, Dr. Larakis maybe to define what we mean by severe, but if it's uh, meets our established societal guidelines and, and recommendations for imaging that this is severe primary MR. Uh, we, I have a very low threshold uh, to, to send the patient for surgery because uh, otherwise we're, we're running the risk of uh, left ventricular dysfunction, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, the risk of strokes. Um, and some of those things don't get better uh, once patients have them. But if I could make another quick point to your other question to David, um, we, a lot of the data we've seen so far is just volume data, is what, what surgeons do from state to state and nationally from either uh, STS or Medicare. We finally have some data tying volume to outcomes. Uh, David showed that in New York State, that the, the volume threshold, the volume issues really do matter in terms of uh, patient outcomes. And now we, we're going to see some data from the uh, STS, was actually presented at the TCT from Binay Badwar, uh, showing the same thing uh, nationally from STS linked to Medicare data, that uh, volume thresholds do matter because the higher volume centers also deliver uh, better patient outcomes. So that's going to tie into what the ACC and the STS and other societies are doing in terms of trying to define what a center of excellence really is. We need to put some teeth into that. That may actually begin to drive uh, patients uh, being referred to centers of excellence, whether it's surgical or transcatheter. Yeah, what's interesting is, and we'll get to, I'm sure you're moving toward the transcatheter side of treatment of this disease. That's interesting because that one of the uh, benefits of, tra of, of potential technology advancement is getting more more people safer procedures. In other words, it's less complicated, it's easier to execute mm -hmm. safely. So I'm sure you're gonna move into that, but to Bob's point, what we found in New York State and what has been validated now in the STS database is that it depends on your uh, breakpoint 25 or 40. In, our, in New York State it was 25, in the STS it was 40, but when you in New York State had your operation done by someone that simply did a mitral operation every two weeks, your one-year survival improved. That was for degenerative disease. Your one-year survival, forget recurrent mitral regurgitation or reoperation, just your one-year survival improved. So clearly incredible benefits, and yet I would consider even that not exactly high volume. We do 25, we do 15 mitral valve repairs a week here, but you do 25 per year and you're mortality rate improves. So we've got to concentrate volume. We just have to figure out how to do it. Valentin? I think the, the change in the last three years, in my view, is that uh, in the asymptomatic patient, uh, first of all, the operation had four different indications for mitral regurgitation. Mm -hmm. One is either the patient is symptomatic, mm -hmm. Left ventricular and diastolic uh, and systolic diameter or ejection fraction, pulmonary hypertension or atrial fibrillation. Right. Each of these four really led to the operation. Today, what you are talking about is the severity of mitral regurgitation independent of all the right. other four. That to me is the change. And the change is because in institutions or, uh, that, that have high volume, the mortality is so low and you have so much to gain long term that this is a complete switch in the last three years, in my view. So you would recommend uh, a mitral surgery, severe MR, definitely severe yeah. MR, without any of those triggers? And it's tough for the patient. To convince a patient of this, you have to bring the patient every three months and, and try to establish into the mind of the patient that this is the way to go. 
I'm facing two patients at this moment, and it's very difficult because yeah. they feel very well. You cannot say any of these parameters is present, and then how do you do it? So it requires a lot of talking with the patient about it. And, and you know, Bob, I'll just comment about this paper from, an, an, and I don't remember which journal it was in, about AFib and the, the impact of paroxysmal AFib, non-persistent AFib on survival in the setting of severe MR was profound. I mean, we are talking about some big chunks and event-free survival when you are operated on for a class one trigger that affect you after your operation. So I, I do think there's continuing to be a loud message here about why prophylactic surgery will, will prevent, will, will save or improve event-free survival. What do you think of that? No, I, I, no, I agree. And I, I think it's uh, right in line with uh, most of our practice uh, at my institution also. And, and the other index to keep an eye on is left atrial size, which kind of goes along with the risk of atrial fibrillation. It's in, already in the uh, European guidelines if it's in association with a flail leaflet. And we are in the process of updating the U.S. guidelines. I, I, don't, I can't say or don't know whether the L.A. size will be there or not, but it's something else to keep in mind clinically, certainly if the L.A. is getting bigger and bigger. The, the hopefully, and then we'll move on, because I don't want to dominate this, Greg, but the thing that we need is that now we have the New York State data in Jack, and we have the um, STS paper, and what we've got now is two different volume numbers that, by the way, match directly the STS data from five or eight years ago. The guidelines need to put a number on it. Whether you call it 25 or 40, it doesn't matter to me, but we can't, we can't keep saying high volume asterisk or expert center asterisk. There right. needs to be some, some volume criteria associated with who should be doing elective degenerative valve repair. Yeah, from a political point of view, it's always been hard to mandate or require those types of volume relationships in the U.S. So I do want to go to transcatheter mitral valve repair for degenerative mitral regurgitation. So the mitral clip in the United States is approved for degenerative mitral regurgitation for patients who are at prohibitive risk for surgery. And that was based on an early randomized trial almost a decade ago, which showed that mitral valve surgery was more effective, not as safe, but more effective than the mitral clip. So in the U.S. until recently, that's what the mitral clip was reserved for. So uh, I'll go to a new, um, I'm sure you are approached with patients who have less than prohibitive risk for mitral regurgitation. They are maybe intermediate risk. There's somewhat increased risk, but they could certainly undergo surgery, and probably some low-risk patients who would prefer not to have surgery. And these patients may make it uh, to your doorstep. And I'm sure you tell them they should do the right thing, but, but what is your approach to those patients, and when does a patient cross the threshold where you might consider a uh, transcatheter mitral valve repair for degenerative MR? I think uh, like you just started this uh, uh, evening's program, that uh, heart team is pro the key uh, in this. And I think with a lot of education around, all the cardiologists know that when they are referred, uh, they are either referred to the interventionalist or directly to a surgeon. Right. Even if it's referred to an interventionalist, um, I think one thing I need to know from everybody here is how would you define, um, though the, you know, the, when the clip was, um, approved, they did use a word moderate to severe MR. Uh, the reason may be because whether you're doing transthoracic or a TEE, because many times during sedation, uh, the severe MR has become a moderate MR. Yeah. Um, and even though we think after, uh, you know, the echocardiographer, the interventionist thing, it's doable, but a surgeon has to see the patient and they finally have the final, uh, I would say, the gatekeepers to tell us, yes, they cannot do surgery, and like you said, you know, it's a borderline STS. You have a bar STS of uh, uh, maybe between six to seven, but the surgeon may then say there is some other comorbidities uh, with right. the patient that they think, uh, you know, one other thing that they really are worried about is a hostile mediastinum for whatever reason. You know, patient had prior radiation, now has a hostile mediastinum, they are not interested in going back into the sure. chest. So that's where I think an intermediate uh, um, uh, STS risk with that we have done uh, the transcatheter, but the uh, we, heart team is a key, and uh, everybody has to agree, and there has to be a note from all of us saying that we have now decided patients should get a transcatheter uh, treatment. So there are randomized trials that are ongoing now for intermediate risk uh, patients of surgical repair versus uh, mitral clip. 
And now it's a decade later, so the learning curve has been traversed. We're much better at doing the mitral clip than we were a decade ago. But still, surgery is going to be able to more consistently eliminate mitral regurgitation than the mitral clip. So we'll see if that small amount of residual MR compared to the risk of the procedures makes a difference in the current era. There is a, there is a study that actually you wrote the editorial in JAG, which is the longest study in, in, uh, in repair by the Toronto, the Toronto group. Uh, and they have a 20-year follow-up of mitral valve repair. I don't think you are going to beat that with any kind of clipping. I'm sorry to tell you this, because even if you look at the five-year follow-up of the Everest mm -hmm. study, I think the clipping is doing very well, even with patients that are even older. So what I'm saying is that uh, I, I, I just have my doubts about clipping in patients that are not I would say you should not be a candidate for surgery, then you right. can do it, because the data, I don't know, you wrote the editorial comment about this. Bob, what do you, what do you think? Well, uh, no, I agree entirely, Valentin, but the, another paper you published in Jack that you invited me and David to write the editorial about came from the Mayo Clinic, you know, one of the uh, higher volume, higher quality centers where they pointed out that either residual or recurrent MR, uh, when done surgically, uh, leads to a bad outcome. So I agree entirely with you that the clip is likely to give you very similar results, but how many surgical centers can achieve what uh, David achieves here and the Mayo Clinic achieves? So in many of the lower volume centers, we, we know they're repairing valves, but we don't know what their recurrence rate is, and that could lead to a bad outcome, and that, in which case the clip may not be a bad alternative. Yeah, I or think, compared to transcatheter mitral valve replacement, where you've got to anticoagulate and have other complications. Yeah, Greg, the issue really is, and the reason we didn't participate in the, the latest trial for intermediate risk is because I, I can't support that the, the life expectancy over 10 years. Because if if you want to talk about patients where they have the competing risk of other form, of, 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 for instance, an 80 year old, I'm I'm very interested. When you get to be 70, your life expectancy is 16 years. I, I just, it gets hard to commit yourself to a double orifice repair, a potential, an increased risk for MR. It's gonna have to, you, we both know that. It's gonna be, except in the super selected patients you may get fortunate in, and you've got an extremely low risk procedure you're against. I mean, it's not this, oh, well, the patient doesn't want it. Remember, the, uh, the typical patient with degenerative MR has an STS predicted risk of mortality of 0.6 or 0.5. These are very low risk patients. So hard to get to the 60 year old with a a clip. An 80-year-old, I get very interested. Yeah. Younger people, I'm a lot less so, interested. So right now, the, the question is the intermediate risk. You know, the, clearly the low-risk patients need to be operated on, and the nice thing about science is we'll, we'll, we'll see how the studies turn out. So let's go to functional MR, secondary MR, because that's actually Greg, more complicated. Greg, just, just before we move on, remember, all the TMBR trials are done in patients that have very limited life expectancy. The right. two-year co-op survival was, I mean, mortality rate was 29%. So these are patients where a five-year plan is a great victory. Right. A degenerative patient with that's 65 that has P2 prolapse has a normal life expectancy and the insurance company tells you you're living to 86. You pay the same insurance as someone that didn't have heart surgery. That's why trials in intermediate risk and prolapse can't be stopped at two or three or five years with approval, because what we really have to know is what happens in the long term. Great. Okay, so let's go on to functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. And this is more complicated because here, again, the valve is really pretty normal until late in the disease. And the problem is you've got either global or regional left ventricular dysfunction with LV dilatation. And that causes geometric distortion of the papillary muscles, and that pulls on the mitral valve leaflets. It tethers them so they can't close, they can't approximate. And we've known for a long time that when you have LV dysfunction and you develop secondary MR of either moderate or severe degree, that your prognosis is worth. You have higher mortality and higher heart failure hospitalization. But until recently, we didn't know that if you um, interdict in that disease process the secondary aspect of heart failure, whether you could improve prognosis. And why this is complicated is that we now have two randomized trials, as Malik mentioned, with diametrically opposite results. 
We have the MITRE-FR trial from France, which was about 300 patient randomized trial on its surface, severe MR, LV dysfunction, no benefits. Safe procedure, but the mitre clip offered no benefits in terms of death or heart failure hospitalization in two years. And we have the COAP trial, in which I was one of the principal investigators on. On its surface, it looked quite similar, but here we had a marked reduction in mortality, number needed to treat of about five patients to save a life, number needed to treat of three patients to present heart failure, prevent heart failure hospitalization, patients felt better, exercised longer, had better echocardiographic, um, reverse remodeling, et cetera. So everyone's trying to figure out, and the FDA, by the way, has, based on this study, has approved the MitraClip now for secondary or functional MR. And it's the only randomized trial, including surgery, that has shown a benefit. And in contrast to degenerative MR, this is an area where surgery has not been shown in registries to have um, a prognostic benefit, even a suggestion. So the question really becomes, who are the right patients to treat? because we have a group clearly that can get better. And we were talking p-values of 10 zeros and a one. This wasn't a subtle benefit. And then there's clearly a group that aren't going to benefit. And so we don't want to over-treat. So let me ask um, uh, Sean. I want to go to Sean and then, then your Larrakis. You've looked at, I'm sure, these studies very, very carefully. Um, and I won't tell you what the FDA said yet. But, but how can we identify which patients with secondary MR have severe enough MR, are not too far gone, have the right mix of comorbidities, et cetera, that they can really benefit by a low-risk transcatheter mitral valve repair? So if, you look, if you look at most of the, the heart failure trials, if you look at patients with heart failure who have secondary manifestations of heart failure, so where the primary problem is the dilated cardiomyopathy phenotype, and then you look at all of the things that come with it, pulmonary hypertension, atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia, mitral regurgitation, if you treat those things, you may make those symptoms better, but in general, you don't treat the underlying cause so patients don't get better. So I was one of the first to say that COAPT was going to be negative. There's no way that by treating a symptom of a cardiomyopathy that you're going to make the cardiomyopathy better. And yet, it was a positive trial following on the heels of mitro FR. So the, the question then becomes, well, why was it? So I think that the, the, the fact that We've identified a group of patients where in treating that mitral regurgitation has an impact on survival. We have to define, well, why are those patients benefiting? And the reality is that they were sick, but not too sick, that there's still some life in that ventricle and there's still some contractile reserve that can be preserved. If you look at the mitral FR component, and I think this has been defined very well by Paul Grayburn and by uh, Milton Packer, and I think we'll get into this with Stam, you know, leading the way, is that in mitra FR, we saw patients who had a proportionate degree of mitral regurgitation. Their ventricles, in general, were a lot more dilated, a lot bigger than the groups of patients that we saw in COAPT. And as a result of that, they had a degree of mitral regurgitation which was proportionate to the size of their ventricle. If you look at how they defined severe MR in mitra FR, it was also an EROA of greater than 0.2. And so they had lesser degrees of mitral regurgitation, greater de degrees of ventricular dilatation, and as a result of, the, of that, their, their mitral regurgitation was more proportionate. And so what you had then was a, a group of patients who had really advanced heart failure, really advanced cardiomyopathies, as opposed to the COAP population where their ventricles were a little bit smaller, the degree of mitral regurgitation was more severe compared to those in mitra FR. So they had a degree of mitral regurgitation for whatever reason that seemed disproportionate to the degree of left ventricular remodeling. And therefore, by taking that load off of the ventricle, one can then postulate that what you did is you abrogated the remodeling process, or at least you slowed down the remodeling process. And we know from all the trials of, of heart failure, the, the therapies that slow or reverse the remodeling process are associated with improvements in survival, and that's what we see in that co-apt population. Yeah, and, and, and this didn't occur by accident. I mean, we, we wanted specifically to not have what we called blown ventricles. We had ejection fractions of 20 to 50%, but we capped the upper left ventricular size. So the ventricle just wasn't a big, boggy ventricle. So we enrolled, as you say, ventricles that were moderately dilated, but not severely dilated. And we also used uh, the United States American Society of Echocardiography criteria to quantify severe MR, three plus or four plus, but severe, which was much more rigorous and much more severe than what at that time was the European criteria that were used in the uh, MITRE-FR trial. So Stam, 
Um, when you're looking at an, an echo and a ventricle, how are you going to determine, you know, I, I don't want you to get too complex, but, but what is severe MR that might benefit from being um, uh, fixed with a mitral clip, and how, what is a good ventricle to fix and a bad ventricle to fix? Yes, uh, <clears throat> that's a great question, and uh, the issue with the secondary MR is more difficult to evaluate uh, compared to the primary MR. And... Uh, most of the guidelines recommend to evaluate many uh, parameters and not only place your, uh, uh, the only thing is the EROA. Um, you have to evaluate the regurgitative volume, the regurgitative fraction, but also all other semi-quantitative uh, measurements. So, and also uh, very important is the ejection fraction. Uh, because if you have severe uh, LV dysfunction, like ejection fraction less than 20%, most likely that patient will not benefit from, uh, from matra clip or any other kind of uh, matra therapy. Also, if you have, uh, as, you, as you say, and as the matra FR, so if you have ventricles that are huge, uh, those ventricles also would not benefit. So I think that uh, uh, EROA is a good uh, number, but... Uh, to have in mind and make a decision, but also we have to take into consideration the LV ejection fraction and the LV size, as the previous uh, speakers in the panel alluded to. So it's basically a moving target, but I think uh, EROA of 0.3 uh, and above, I think should be considered for uh, uh, matra clip or other procedures, uh, transcatheter therapies, and uh, assuming the ejection fraction and the size of the ventricle are also taken into the context of the EROA. So, so Anu, coming back to you now, are you, are you working with heart failure? Is the, is the heart team functioning to identify these patients? Uh, because the patients who can benefit, I mean, had a marked reduction in mortality. Uh, you know, it's about a 17% reduction, absolute reduction in mortality in two years, so saving one out of six lives. So are you seeing more of these patients? Are you going to heart failure clinics? How do you identify the right patient? Because I will tell you, in the past, we all saw, you know, we would get these echoes. And as soon as you see the EF at 20%, 25%, you don't care what the pulmonary pressure is. You don't care how bad the MR is or the TR is. You say it's a terrible ventricle. But now we've got to think a little bit differently. Now there is a component of this secondary volume overload, and volume overload begets volume overload. So you can make things worse, and we, can, we can't cure the patients. As David was saying, they still had a 29% two-year mortality. Still pretty bad, but it was about 50% in the ones that we didn't fix. So what are you doing to find the right patients and exclude the wrong patients? Uh, going back, I think now we will have to add an extra person, which will be heart failure when it comes to secondary MR. But since, although the FDA has approved, CMS has still not approved the procedure, so we are very cautious. Uh, the, the, so the only functional MR, we have not been doing those procedures. So the, we, what we have been doing is the mixed. Though they have functional MR, they could have some primary pathology with some restriction sure. of the anterior leaflet. Those are the kind of cases we have done. And I think we have worked with all heart failure doctors who have been here, and they have been referring cases. But I think a big difference, what uh, Sean just mentioned, between the two trials was the same in COAPT you guys made sure the patient was on full medical therapy, yeah. which used to be a diuretic, a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor. On therapy, uh, and about 30% of the patient also had a, a bioventricular AICD. On that, they are asymptomatic. So essentially, right. what they said was uh, GDMT. So uh, if yeah. they, on that, if they are symptomatic, then we need a heart failure team definitely yeah. say that, yes, they are on medical therapy and they have symptoms, okay? Those are the kinds yeah. of the cases of the secondary uh, functional MR. We will be doing the procedure. And I think, like Stam mentioned, not just, uh, you know, it's a quantity of MR. And I think EF, what, uh, having done cases uh, as a team, I would say, 30 may be a cutoff, anything less than that, we may not see a lot of benefit in these patients, but definitely you would, we see benefit in the patients with secondary MR when um, they are, uh, you know, they get the so, percutaneous procedure. So, so you made one very important point I want to emphasize is that we enrolled patients 
who were on maximally tolerated doses of all class one heart failure guideline directed therapies. And that was a beta blocker, an ACE inhibitor, or an ARB, or an ARNI, um, a mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, and cardiac resynchronization therapy if appropriate. And these patients were still symptomatic, and they still had severe mitral regurgitation. So those are the patients that really benefited. And we actually saw a lot of patients that were presented to us who weren't maxed out on medical therapy yet. And we told the sites, no, you got to double or triple the beta blocker and the ACE inhibitor, et cetera. And if they don't improve, then come back to us. And a lot of those patients improved. So really, medical therapy is still the foundation. And we shouldn't be doing any of our therapies in heart failure patients, either mitral clip or surgery, until they've failed medical therapy. So I want to go to David and then, then Bob and then back to Sean. So, so David, I know you have some comments to make, but I want to ask you now in this modern era, what's the role of surgery for secondary MR? Well, I, I don't think there's much for one unless you need revascularization or you've got an, an anatomy that's not favorable for clip therapy. Again, you have a limited life expectancy. You should try and avoid surgery if you can. I think that the main topic that Greg and I'll first by con con congratulate you and Mike for running this trial. The reason this trial was, was the first one and only one to show a difference was the discipline of the, of the principal co-PIs in the screening committee to basically put your foot down about optimizing medical therapy. And I'm on the writing panel, as you know, for the institutional and individual requirements for mm -hmm. TMBR therapy, and that's why CMS is still waiting to get the approval because they're what you know our documents still percolating through societies. But the key to, to getting outcomes that you want to duplicate and co-op and not mitra FR is not putting pressure on it. It's not that you're on four different drugs. It's or, or have an or have a uh, by the pacer. It's that you left the patient in a heart failure clinic for the appropriate amount of time. And this is something that I think is going to be really interesting to watch in the future. I, I believe that what you're going to have to have in heart failure, if you want to duplicate co-op results and not mitra FR results, is just like you have a tumor board. You're going to have to have a meeting where you review patients just like you did on those screening calls and really ask the questions about optimization of therapy, yeah. not just are you on therapy, but have you really been pushed to define for each individual patient what the maximum tolerated doses are? Only then can you expect to identify the disproportionate MR cases that you're truly going to get survival benefit in. So, so I want to ask Bob and Sean kind of related questions. Um, so now let's talk about the real world, OK? Because in the real world, there are patients who aren't yet on maximally tolerated medical therapy. And yet they're so symptomatic, and they've got you know, very severe MR. And we don't know that those patients won't benefit by a mitral clip. In fact, they probably will. I can tell you, Milt Packer thinks it's crazy to have to push medicines up to the max. And Sean, you can comment on this. He goes, those patients are going to benefit. But I say, Milt, we don't have any data yet to support that. Uh, we have data to do it the way we did it in the trial. So what do you do about that kind of situation? What do you do about the asymptomatic patient with torrential MR? We excluded those patients. What if the EF's a little lower than 20% or a little higher than 50%? What if there's somewhat more of an atrial mechanism than a ventricular mechanism? All these patients were excluded. They're all fodder for future studies. So maybe five to eight years from now, maybe we'll have some answers. But it's going to be a long time coming. So I can tell you that FDA looked very, very carefully at the COAP data. And every single subgroup of patients in our trial benefited and benefited tremendously. So they basically approved it for the indications, very strict indications that we enrolled patients with. So Bob and then Sean, what do you do when patients don't exactly fit those criteria in the real world? Well, I, I think we need to sit back and uh, not get too excited about um, doing more interventions until we have more data. Um, so I just put a hold on that. First of all, I'm not too concerned about asymptomatic patients. These patients are rarely asymptomatic. They're coming to you because they are in heart failure and agree entirely with the doctors Kinney and Pinney that the, the heart failure specialist is probably the most important part of the team. Um, this is, I mean, it's really a heart failure trial that you did. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but it was an excellent trial. And um, uh, Greg, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with all the points that have been made so far. Um, the disproportionate, proportionate thing, I think, is, is, is real. 
it's a great concept, but taking an individual patient and trying to say this patient fits into the proportionate or the disproportionate doesn't work. The, the Milton Packer Grayburn diagram is nice, but they have discrete mean data. I've actually plotted the uh, standard deviations about those mean data. There's a fair amount of overlap, and that's just with one standard deviation. If you take two, there's incredible overlap. And that diagonal line, which is where they define the uh, proportion, it's, it's based upon a 50% regurgitant in fraction, but we know that even a 40% or 30% regurgitant in fraction in that degree of MR is a lot of MR. That moves the diagonal line down such that every patient now fits into the uh, uh, proportionate. So, it's a great concept. I think that the other points that have been made already are really key to COAP. That you, this was a tough trial. We were, we were an investigative site, and it took a lot to get a patient enrolled. Yeah. We were constantly being told to up titrate this or that, and then now the patient's a candidate for CRT, and you had to wait 90 days to see whether the CRT worked or not. And so. I think the challenge is going to be, getting back to your question about the real world, is whether, uh, what kind of um, limits do we put on medical therapy? How, how long? Is it three months, six months before we term the patient to be uh, uh, not um, responding to medical therapy? And a question for you is, if you look at the Mitra FR data, those patients were on those drugs too. But I, I don't think it was as rigorously controlled in terms of the doses and the uh, the time frame and so forth. And the other thing which may be politically difficult for you to, uh, to uh, address is whether the operators were different because you came in with uh, less residual MR and more clips being employed. More patients in COAP had two or three clips. Um, so I don't know if that's also a factor or not. Or, or is it these patients in Mitra FR who had the proportionate degree of uh, MR? Had valves that were just not clippable because they were right. they were too far exactly. gone. Then you couldn't you couldn't actually create good resolution of MR with those ventricles. Yeah, it is a political hot button issue whenever you talk about it. But it, it does turn out that the the U.S. and Canadian operators that were in COAP had been using the MitraClip for. 10 plus years in five different studies. And, and it's a procedure, like anything else, like any surgery. It's a procedure and you get better with greater volume. For the French operators, this was, for most of them, their first use of the MitraClip. And they did a pretty good job, but when you looked at the outcomes, the acute resolution of MR was greater in coapt, the complication rate was lower, and probably most importantly, as, as Bob just mentioned, the recurrence rate was also lower. And it's more clips were used in coap relatively despite the fact that the ventricles and probably the coaptation lines were shorter and the ventricles were smaller. So there may be some differences, and technique and obviously uh, procedural volume does matter. So Sean, other uh, words to the wise for patient selection for functional MR repair. Yeah, I'll try not to be duplicative, and uh, I just want to emphasize what, what Dr. Adams said, which is that you know this the role of the heart failure cardiologist here is central, because this is a, a problem with the ventricle, and we're very very good at understanding what all the therapies are that are available and and matching the right therapy to the deserving patient. We're also very very good at at mapping out patient trajectories, and you know Greg, you brought it up that the the two year mortality was twenty nine percent, the one year mortality was twenty percent. So if you compare that right now to the, the current left ventricular assist device, the, the HeartMate 3 device, one-year survival is 86%. So here you have a device which is more powerful, if you will, in the right patient than MitroClips. And so I think we have to keep in mind that the trajectory, understand what trajectory patients are on, and match the right therapy to that patient. And Sean, you know, we've shared so many patients over the years, and when we see patients in our clinic that we think will benefit from a heart failure evaluation, we don't hear from you again for three or four or six months. It's not like we have them see you once and we, we, right. we have the case on the schedule in, in a month from now. We, we basically tell the patient we'll reconvene when, when heart failure says so. And I believe that's how that's gonna get popularized, that concept, don't you? Uh, I'll tell you that the, the strongest supporters of, of what we do are cardiothoracic surgeons. I'll tell you, you know, you were kind enough to invite me to the mitral conclave, I don't know, four years ago, five years ago, whenever it was, and gave a talk on, on guideline-directed medical therapy. And first of all, that was pretty intimidating. There were about 500 surgeons there, and I'm like, I'm not, <laughs> not in my usual chummy crowd of heart failure docs. 
um, very intimidating audience. And then one by one, they came up to the, to the microphone and said, you know, I had this patient, I sent him to the heart failure doc and the, the MR went away. And then another stood up and said the same thing. And they're like, we need to understand what it is that you do because you make MR go away. And so, you know, having heard that, I got a little bit more optimistic, but you, know, you yourself, Dr. Adams, and your colleagues have been very, very strong supporters. And when I spoke at the conclave this year, the gentleman sitting next to me, the cardiothoracic surgeon, just leaned over after I presented this long patient history, said, there is so much about what you do that I don't understand and that I need to learn. And I think it's a great opportunity because we have this heart team to open up that dialogue and understand all the therapies that we have available to us. So i just make one comment, and then I want to ask Valentina a question. Uh, I will say that the patients that were in COAPT, um, most of them probably would not have been eligible for a VAD. They had tremendous numbers of comorbidities with severe renal dysfunction, frailty, uh, baseline anemia, et cetera. And the one thing I will say also about the MitraClip is it's one of the safest procedures that we do. Um, there are rarely procedural complications or long-term complications from the device. So, I think for most of my patients, I would want to see them at least have an attempt at that before they get a, uh, a VAD, a HeartMate 3, and you know all the potential issues with infections and hemolysis, et cetera. Hopefully, we'll need another hour in a few years, Greg, to talk about which patients get MitraClip versus yeah. transcatheter mitral valve replacement. Yeah. Right. I, yeah, and then I, that's where I wanted to close. But first, I wanted to ask Valentin. Uh, Valentin, often the prognosis of these patients is actually driven by the right side of the heart and not the left side. And, and we excluded uh, from COAP patients with severe pulmonary hypertension and severe RV dysfunction. We had a lot of patients with moderate pulmonary hypertension and moderate RV dysfunction. They still benefited compared to control, although those remained, even in the MitraClip arm, independent multivariable predictors of poor outcomes. So tell us more about how we should be thinking about the right side of the heart and, and when is pulmonary hypertension too severe or RV dysfunction too severe that we need to be thinking about uh, either bivads or heart transplant. <clears throat> we are dealing with a field that you have to personalize, number one. You cannot just say, <clears throat> this is the, the pulmonary vascular resistance, so I stop here. No, because there are so many variables that are playing a role here. However, I would like to emphasize, just listening to the discussion that just took place, that these patients are very sick. And unless you have data, I'm going back to the previous conversation, unless you have data on trials of entering patients different than the group that you did, I think we have to be very, very careful. Uh, these patients are very sick, and their life span is very short. So I would, what I would say to you is that I'm not sure how excited I am in, in getting into all these procedures on patients that you don't have data and the length of life is so short. And if you go to the right side of the heart, things get worse. Yeah. And that is, you are now describing to me the worst patient that you can see. And that is a patient with a left ventricle that is lousy, significant mitral regurgitation, and on top, the right side of the heart is in the process of failing. Uh, I just would say this is an extreme that uh, Maybe you may individualize some case, but I, I just feel quite skeptical. Stam, any further comments on that, on how when, when you look echocardiographically at biventricular dysfunction, how you assess those patients? Uh, I mean, today we have the better determinants for that, like uh, LV strain. I think that's the better way to evaluate uh, LV function because we know also from the aortic stenosis and uh, other diseases that uh, what you look with uh, the contractility doesn't represent exactly the function of the ventricle. So LV strain, right ventricular strain, I think all these things, 3D uh, volumetric imaging, I think will be very important for the future. And uh, uh, 3D imaging also will be critical as we move forward in this field. Okay, so I wanted to, uh, Sean, you have a comment? No, I was just gonna add that if you're getting to the point where you have clinical biventricular failure, that's a bridge too far. You're not gonna rescue that with a mitral clip or a TMVR. And some of the ways that we look at it, besides clinical grounds, ascites and lower shunner edema, is the, the PAPI, the pulmonary arterial pulsatility index. And if your PAPI is less than two or less than 1.8, then that's a, a person whose right ventricle is blown, and you're not gonna get that back by taking the pulsatile load off by clipping the mitral valve. On the other hand, if you get them a little bit before that, I, I do think that that's why there was a survival advantage. 
know, in spite of what I said about LV remodeling, I think that the patients who survived or, or achieved a witness day survival advantage from mitral clip was because you, you took the load off the right ventricle. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the survival curves in, in, in COAPT, and I know you and I talked about this, it's right about the nine month mark, and that's when they begin to diverge. So I think what happens in those first nine months are the patients who are frail are gonna die, and they died. The patients who needed an LVAD or a transplant, hopefully they got an LVAD or a transplant. Many of them did not. And then the, 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 uh, the, the group that had severe right ventricular failure, they died. And then at the nine month mark, that's what you see, are the, the patients who benefited, and I think it's gonna be the right ventricle. So I wanted, I wanted to go to yeah. Malik. I wanted to ask you a question, and then I wanna come back to David and talk about the future, and Anu, and talk about the future of transcatheter um, uh, mitral surgical and transcatheter approaches. So, um, you know, Malik, you've now written a monograph on this topic, okay? So um, I, I know you're very interested in this concept of proportionate and disproportionate MR. And there's proportionate and there's disproportionate and there's a non-severe mitral regurgitation. So, so in your view, when, when we look at a patient, you're a clinician now looking at a patient and trying to decide if they've, you know, people call disproportionate MR, MR dominant disease. The MR is dominating their presentation. They call non-severe MR where the LV is dominating their presentation. So what are some of the clues that you're gonna look at clinically when you see a patient to decide if fixing their MR might improve their prognosis? Uh, as, thank you, Dr. Stone. Um, so as Dr. Penny and Dr. Bono alluded earlier, as well as Dr. Larrakis, um, it comes down to LV geometry and I think also to the EROA. Uh, in terms of Graeber and Packer have written extensively about this as well, but uh, I think first off, in terms of disproportionate versus proportionate MR, we have to be aware that this is a conceptual framework for analyzing and understanding the results of COAPT and MITRE-FR, but we cannot, it hasn't been validated prospectively in terms of management decisions, so uh, I don't think we can go based on evaluating that alone per design referral. However, based on COAPT, I would say that the patients that I think are more likely to have disproportionate MR are the patients that have larger effective regurgitant orifice areas, um, and then also smaller left ventricular and diastolic volumes, as Mitre FR had much larger LVEDV with the 135 per meter squared, and then COAPT had 101 100. per meter squared. So those are the clinical clues that can point you towards right. one direction or the other. And then as Dr. Bono said earlier, the patients that were enrolled were moderate to severe MR, and severe MR implies a regurgitant fraction of 50%, whereas moderate MR, 40%. And uh, depending on where they fall on the curve, you know, if it's like less than the curve, then you say it's proportionate, and if it's higher, then you say it's disproportionate. But as I said earlier, I think uh, it's a little bit early and soon to make medical management decisions yeah. based on this. So we, we've agreed in principle to combine the databases of Mitra FR and COAP. So hopefully we can do uh, an individual patient data level analysis so we can hopefully come up with a risk score as to patients that may benefit or may not benefit. And then we'll learn a little bit more about the importance of medical therapies and how good the procedure is, et cetera. Um, trying to get the data out of France to send to the United States in this environment, believe it or not, is not so easy. It's uh, very, very difficult, but we're working through those issues and we're excited about that. Greg, it's hard to send it across the park, let alone yeah, the I know, countries. I know. But I, Greg, before we move on, I just wanted to congratulate you for this document. Um, I'd had a chance to review it, and particularly for those of you that want a blueprint about how it should be done, when you look at his summary of practical applications of clinical practice, you'll see a very thoughtful way to individualize the, the decision making for each patient after the heart failure team is done with them. So I congratulate you. I think that's an excellent yeah. job. Thank you, Dr. Adams. You know, and in COAPT, if you had to remember three parameters, it's 85% um, of the patients qualified with either an EROA, an effective regurgitant orifice area, of greater than or equal to 0.3 centimeters squared, or pulmonary systolic vein flow reversal. That defines severe MR. And then they had a left ventricular end systolic dimension of no more than seven centimeters. So that kind of picked up most of the patients who benefited from an anatomic point of view. So now I wanna to come to Anu and, and David, and, and actually Bob, to get some insights of where we're going in the future. So, um, I, you know, it's interesting. I, I think when Alfieri developed this technique, and David, I'm sure you will uh, um, agree with me, I mean, it was dismissed across the globe. 
He was basically doing it in salvage patients who didn't have the time. It's very easy, right? It takes five or 10 minutes to put a stitch between the anterior and posterior mitral leaflets. He was doing it primarily in salvage patients who didn't have time for uh, an undersized annuloplasty ring. The outcomes weren't great. Um, but now when you think about it, what we've learned is that it actually, the stitch or the clip actually addresses the underlying pathophysiology of secondary MR, which is lack of coaptation of the two leaflets. So there's tremendous excitement in the next generation of mitral valve devices, transcatheter devices. And there's more than 60 other devices that have been developed. Only one is approved in the US, about four are approved in Europe. And we have transcatheter annuloplasty devices, we have spacers, we have neocords, we've got uh, a, a lot of ways to do papillary slings transcatheter, a lot of very complex approaches. And then we've got about 30 different transcatheter mitral valves that have been developed. So let me start with David. Um, David, you know more about the pathophysiology um, of the mitral valve than anyone on this table. So which one of these devices do you think are going to have a future? And, and let's just make it simple. Let's just look at annuloplasty and transcatheter valves. Does annuloplasty have a future? Well, let, let me just say one thing first about my good friend Octavio Alfieri, because you know, he actually developed that, Greg, as you know, 15, 20 years ago, and still does it routinely yep. in very select patients. Um, and he was also fairly selective and his technique was really primarily popularized for things like mitralian or calcification and for patients that weren't great candidates for conventional <laughs> techniques. And its success rate, it wasn't that it was vilified. The problem was it had a sort of 70% or 80% success rate, which was, wasn't going to beat Carpentier's technique. So in the transcatheter era, he would win easily. He would probably be able to design a trial and be non-inferior. So his results were good. They just weren't as good as open right. surgery. And then the problem was it got popularized and was used default as a bailout. Right. And that's where it got a bad name. And the last thing I mentioned is that mitral clip or clip technologies do something very different. Those sutures are taking at the free edge of mitral mm -hmm. valves, and of course, with the clips, you're grasping the body of the leaflet and probably getting better septolateral yeah. cinching, I think you're right. which is what we didn't know at the time in surgery. So I think in the and future- And on a beating heart as well. Yeah, exactly. I think in the future, I, I think that if we can get transcatheter or mitral valve replacement right, transeptal, and safe, it's going to be hard to beat. It's a single procedure. It definitely eliminates the mitral regurgitation. There's not going to be a lot of selection required once you pass the heart failure uh, bridge, and patients have limited life expectancy. So it's 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 hard to bet against it if you're unless you're an, the perfect clip candidate, unless you're the perfect clip candidate. So. It's going to be really interesting to see. I think those algorithms will be clearly defined. And I think if you have a perfect anatomy for a mitral clip, you fit perfectly into the co-app type data, or who knows what Pasquale and other studies are going to show us in the future, you'll probably get that. And if you don't, or you have more complex pathophysiology or more unclear anatomy, a transcatheter replacement for limited life expectancy patients or high risk patients should be able to eliminate the mitral regurgitation. Annuloplasties. Interesting, it's again like Alfieri surgery hasn't been that interesting, for instance, in heart failure MR, but there may be characteristics of some of these devices that are different than what surgery mm -hmm. did. So the only way to, to see that is to actually do the studies and see. And there's been a relatively high recurrence rate after undersized annuloplasty and, and heart why failure, but. It would take a device victory. It's something that the device is doing differently than surgery, yeah. which I, I won't rule out till I see the device and understand it and see some data. But if I had to put my quarter on new technology in the future, I'll, I'm, I'm, and I'm saying that with all, full disclosure, I'm what the Marty Lee and I are the two national code PIs right. in the Apollo trial. So we're obviously interested in it. But um, if we can get there, then I think you'll be picking between some sort of clip therapy and some sort of transcatheter valve replacement therapy five or eight years from now based on anatomy. So let me go to Anu and then end with Bob. So, you know, Anu, I, I, I'm not going to let David respond now because I'm so surprised to always hear from the surgeon the excitement about transcatheter mitral valve replacement because for 20 years we've been hearing repair, 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 repair. But the now life expectancy. <laughs> But now we're hearing replacement. And it is true that transcatheter mitral valve replacement is likely to eliminate mitral regurgitation. 
Um, but with the mild amount of MR we've seen left by the clip, we've not seen that that's necessarily a negative prognostic thing in heart failure patients. And the thing about the clip is extraordinarily safe. So TMVR, that is replacement, it makes a big hole. There can be vascular complications. There can be ASDs. There can be left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. There's more likely to be hemolysis. You've got to anticoagulate the patients. Everyone thinks the procedure is going to be more complicated, although the effectiveness may be greater because of eliminating MR. So I'd love to get your take on the future of transcatheter mitral valve therapies, particularly annuloplasty, which, again, might be very low risk, um, and transcatheter mitral valve replacement. So when we first started doing the clip, uh, all we did was a central clip. And, uh, you know, the kind of patients we were selecting also was very less selective. But uh, as we got better and better, and that's the number I think everybody's looking for, um, the publications are such that I think if you're done 30 cases, you probably will say then you are um, there that you can do any, uh, probably take on some complex cases. The complex cases are the same. They're not central. They're lateral jet or medial jet. And we have been doing those kind of cases. So and I think the anatomy and physiology of mitral valve is so complex. We cannot say there is one treatment, percutaneous treatment strategy for this patient. So there will be patients that may say, we say, OK, this, is, this patient may be good for a clip. But there will be a group of patients where we'll say, I, uh, though the mitral, uh, uh, transcatheter mitral valve uh, treatment will be difficult, probably you know, we will get there, as long as it is uh, transeptal. Uh, and uh, not uh, transepical, and I think uh, we will be the, uh, one of the couple of first centers to be doing this uh, transeptal uh, procedure. Um, it's the same. It, is, it, it will be technically challenging, but I think we can get there. Uh, but annuloplasty, percutaneous annuloplasties are out there, but few patients may benefit from that. So compared to tower, where we know, I think one or two different kind of valve, it is straightforward, simple. Mitral will be such that we will have so many other devices with us, and I think as a heart team, the surgeon and the interventionist as a team will make a decision which would be the right percutaneous uh, treatment that patient should receive. Yeah, and that's really key because, you know, we're, we're always jealous of the surgeon. The surgeon has so many different approaches depending on the exact anatomical issue, whether it's annuloplasty or quadrangular resection or cord shortening or neocords, et cetera. And we've got usually one tool at a time. So we kind of, you know, interventional cardiology, if we've ever been successful, it's been by trying to emulate what the surgeons do successfully, but to do it safer. And here it's very difficult because the mitral valve and its disease is so complex and we need all these different tools to, I think, be able to get close to what the surgeon does. But Greg, you know, the exciting thing is, is that as the Apollo and other trials migrate toward the control arm being mitral clip, we'll learn more about clip efficacy and we'll start to define which patients benefit from which technology yeah, potentially. Exactly. So, Bob, let, you're our special guest. Let me give you the last word here. Um, uh, you know, you've been involved, uh, obviously, treating these patients, researching these patients for, for decades, writing the guidelines. You're a, a devourer of all the data that's out there. So, so give us your 10-year your prediction. What are some of the advances we're going to make? What are the, some of the things you would like to see? What are some of the things you think we're going to see? How is the treatment of primary and secondary MR going to evolve uh, in our lifetime, or at least the last next 10 years? Well, that's really hard to say, because I, I think none of us would have imagined where we are right now with transcatheter technology 10 years ago, or at least 15 years ago. So it's, it's not clear uh, where we're going to go. I mean, co-op. You've, you've probably heard this many times, not from me, but from others. Co-op is kind of uh, the best of worlds and the worst of worlds. If it had been a negative trial, uh, all of this stuff would be kind of unimportant. You could, you could reduce MR, it didn't make a difference. And then it's just like mitral FR, you have two negative trials. You know, why treat functional M MR with either surgery or, or a device? Uh, that's, but now you're the victim of that success right. because now, as David said, what, what are the future trial is going to look like. You know, once you have a CMS-approved device, um, it's going to be difficult to enroll patients into something else, uh, 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 transcatheter mitral valve replacement versus a clip. And is the clip going to be your control arm? Um, uh, or are you going to be talking about patients who are not clippable? 
for whatever reason, who now become candidates yes. for those trials, which makes them different patients entirely. So, I mean, you have a challenge, I think, in, in yeah. designing the trials. Now, I can't, I can't begin to predict how it's going to go, except that I think, uh, getting back to Dr. Pinney, I think as we get better in heart failure treatment, you know, the, 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 the we'll probably be, be better able to prevent patients from, you know, needing these devices and uh, uh, at the same time with an aging population, as uh, yeah. Waka said, we're going to have more patients at the same time. So I uh, certainly encourage uh, you to keep going in this area. It's going to be uh, exciting, but it's going to be a kind of a rough road for you. So do we have any burning questions from the audience? Yes, sir. Jack, Jack it. So my question is to David. Uh, David, uh, it is, uh, makes eminent sense that we have got this OAP trial now and we have got the, um, the, the people with the short life expectancy after that. I don't think it will be, it will be very hard to beat uh, the CLIP, which is one of the simple process. And uh, so you have got large uh, uh, volume regurgitant volume, which was returning back and you have reduced it and you have essentially provided a limited or a finite lifespan to the patient. But what would be the patients where this is a non-direct cardiomyopathy, we have already done the CRTs and all, the younger patients, this is not physiological, what you are doing in the, in the clip. When we do the vortex imaging, we totally destroy, once you put the stitch in the mitral valve, you totally destroy the vortex. And uh, I guess that must have been the case when the LP stitch was done and all. I mean, it is pushed down, it is made smaller, there is no kinetic energy, there is no potential energy which is developed, there's nothing that goes into the left ventricular myocardium. What exactly do you think would really be needed when it comes to the transcutaneous uh, devices as to what exactly would we be able to do in such cases which will be more physiological? I think you're, Jay, you're bringing up an interesting point, and I'll just give credit to Carpentier. He really was the sort of father of that idea, at least related to mitral valve physiology and trying to restore it, and that is that nature never makes mistakes. The mitral valve is designed to, design to, is designed to direct blood to the apex where it turns in a circle and comes back out your outflow track as the anterior leaflet closes. We don't know what the impact, if, if there is any impact long term in terms of creating bioorifice valves and completely changing the inflow pattern to the mitral valve probably matters more if you have to move clips toward the anterior commissural side, which is the predominant inflow side, and less toward the posterior commissural side, which fortunately is where a lot of clips tend to migrate in ischemic patients. And of course, ischemic patients have limited life expectancy and limited activity levels. So you're probably, that's not the sick group that you're gonna see signals in. I think if you start doing clips routinely in otherwise healthy people, I think you're gonna see, probably start seeing some signals. Yeah, and, it, and one of the problems with the clip, uh, you know, in addition to the sophisticated concepts that Jagat was alluding to, is that it does limit your future options. I mean, you are, you know, you, you can't, do a transcatheter mitral valve repair, at least right now. I mean, Abbott's working on a device to remove the clip, but right now there's no way to do that. So it does limit your future options. So it is, I think, ideal for that patient with a relatively limited life expectancy of five years or so. And again, Greg, it goes back to what Anu said. The anatomy is going to have to be perfect. You pretty much are going to have to, if you decide to do a clip, your goal should be let one plus or less MR, which 90% of patients had, I believe, in co-op. I can't remember the number, yeah, but... 60. Yeah, 61 and 92 or 94, right, right, too. 92, two plus it's just going to be unacceptable to have grade 3 or grade 4 MR in anybody, because if you do, you're, you've basically burned the bridges of other transcatheter yeah. procedures, and you're not affecting their survival at all. So, that, well, again, the new trials are going to show us which patients are better right. candidates for which and whether total elimination right. of MR in all patients is going to be worth it yeah. in patients with limited life expectancy. There's no scenario where transcatheter mitral valve replacement will be done in low-risk patients any more than it should be done in surgery. Yeah. So the one thing I'll say, and on a little more positive bent, is if you have a failure after a clip, you can put another clip in. 
you can do a transcatheter annuloplasty, and that will often work. And if you um, do all of that, by then Dr. Penny will have signed off and called the palliative care, so we'll all be happy. Well, no, no. I mean, there, there actually are plenty of people now that have had clips for 20 years that are actually doing very well with them. So, and in the heart failure patient, it doesn't seem like the one to two plus thing is that different. In the degenerative MR uh, world, obviously you want to eliminate NMR. But in the heart failure world, all you want to do is get rid of the torrential mitral regurgitation. And then, you know, we haven't seen a big difference in the prognosis with uh, getting down to zero to one plus versus two plus. But I think the key, Greg, is, is and, and this is something that's so exciting to me for the next decade, are we palliating patients and eliminating symptoms? which is basically what we've done so far, are we truly gonna try and change the trajectory of their life expectancy? And those are very different. Well, models. we are. For, for co-apt, we are making them live longer. Oh, no, There's I know, no Greg, doubt but, about but that. you made 10% live longer for two years. No, no, 17%. 17%. 17 and actually, it, and it looked like about 22% of three years. And, so and it's, that, and again, that's as much as Taver we, for no, no, high-risk patients. No, no, we totally agree. But again, you started with the population that predominantly had already been treated for their, for their proportion right. in MR. So again, you're right. Well-selected patients, you can start to impact their survival short-term. And my question is, hopefully, if all of us are working together the next eight or 10 years, that you're gonna to start to significantly improve life expectancy in 50 or 60 or 80% of patients, not 17% of patients. Great, well, if, I think we, this has been a fantastic discussion, and if we've learned anything from, from this in the day is that there are a lot of nuanced issues here, and where the evidence base is evolving almost on a monthly basis, we're all learning from each other, and it really does take a multidisciplinary team like this, I think, to come up with what is the right therapies for individual patients. It starts with medical therapies, which is the foundation for all of our patients, and then either surgery or transcatheter approaches um, for uh, appropriately selected patients. So I really want to thank uh, our special guest, Bob Bono, for coming today, and Valentina, as always, for organizing this. Uh, just been a great day and an amazing panel. So thank you all.